All right, good morning, everyone. We are starting today with Srimad Bhagavata Mahapurana, book 11, discourse 28, um, still in the Uddhava Gita, the um, spiritual teachings of Sri Krishna to his friend Uddhava. Um, so we last, the last chapter we went through was a um, technically detailed um, vidhi, technically detailed ritual method um, for the ritual worship of Krishna through murtis and through formal puja and so on. Uh, Discourse 28 is called The Highest Truth Discussed. The glorious Lord began again. Visualizing the universe, though brought about, by Prakriti and Purusha as one in substance, a manifestation of the absolute Brahman. One should neither praise nor condemn the nature and actions of others. He who eulogizes or denounces the natural bent of mind and actions of others quickly strays from his purpose on account of his clinging to duality. On the senses being overpowered with sleep, the soul imprisoned in the body, enters the realm of Maya and the shape of the dream state, and having lost its consciousness of the body and surroundings, reaches the state of deep sleep. So does the man perceiving many things experience distraction on coming into contact with the pleasures of sense, and later on finds himself sunk into the depths of ignorance. In the midst of duality, which is unreal, what is good and what is evil, and to what extent a thing is good or bad, whatever is impressed through word, whatever is grasped grasped through the senses, as well as whatever is contemplated with the mind, is ultimately false. A reflection, an echo, and an illusory object, such as a mother of pearl presenting the appearance of silver, though unreal, react upon us as though they were real. So do the body and other entities continue to inspire fear in us till they disappear into their one substratum, Brahman. Therefore, this universe is the spirit inasmuch as it is capable of assuming all forms and almighty, capable of evolving anything and everything. It is that spirit which creates and is created, protects and is protected, destroys and is destroyed. It is both the subject and the object. Therefore, no entity other than the self existing apart from that which is created and so on has been posited. This threefold appearance in the shape of creation, continuance, and destruction in the self has been declared as baseless. In other words, it is its own base. Know the threefold existence being a product of the three gunas as brought about by Maya. He who comes to know this ripeness of jnana and vijnana as taught by me would neither extol nor revile anyone and would move about in the world like the sun, free from partiality and prejudice. Realizing this world as having a beginning and an end and therefore unreal when conceived as apart from the spirit, which is that which continues before its beginning, throughout its entire process and after its end. By means of perception, inference, the authority of the scriptures and one's own direct experience, one should move about in this world unattached. Uddhava submitted. Transmigration is undergone neither by the soul who is the perceiver and therefore self-luminous, nor by the body, which is the object of perception and therefore other than the self. All the same it is experienced, O Lord. By whom is it undergone? The soul is undecaying, unqualified, free from impurities, self-effulgent like fire and unobscured, while the body is material like wood, which undergoes transmigration. The glorious Lord replied, so long as there is contact of the undiscriminating soul with the body, senses and vital airs, Metempsychosis continues to bear fruit, even though it has no reality. Even though phenomena do not exist in the self, metempsychosis does not cease in the case of the embodied soul continuing to think of the objects of senses, even as calamities do not cease to afflict a man in the dream state so long as the dream is not broken, although the objects seen in it do not actually exist. Just as the dream experience brings many a woe to a man who has not yet woken, while the same surely does not infatuate him who has woken up. So what brings sorrow to the ignorant does not afflict a wise man. Grief, delight, fear, anger, greed, infatuation, craving, and other moods, 
as well as birth and death, are seen in relation to the ego and not to the self. The spirit hidden behind the body, the senses, the vital airs in the mind, and identifying itself with them is called the jiva. The subtle body constituted of the gunas and karmas is its material manifestation, and it is variously known as the sutratma or the mahatattva. Controlled by God in the form of the time spirit, it revolves in samsara and the whirly gig of metempsychosis. Cutting down with the sword of wisdom, wetted by worship, this ego sense, which has no root and yet stands revealed in multitudinous forms, and is entertained in relation to the mind, speech, vital airs, and body, a contemplative soul roams about on the globe, destitute of thirst. Wisdom consists in distinguishing the self from the non-self. The Vedas and ascesis in the shape of discharging one's own sacred obligations. The teachings of exalted souls, ratiocination consistent with those teachings, and one's own realization constitute the means uh, um, to the attainment of such discriminating knowledge. And such discrimination results in the conviction that what alone exists at the beginning of creation and will survive at the end of it exists in the middle as well, and that is Brahman revealer as well as the cause of the universe. As gold not yet wrought into various beautiful shapes, which existed before as well as after all that is made out of it, is the same gold even at the middle, while it is being called earring, bangle, or so on. So do I, the cause of the universe, exist before and after the universe, and am designated by different names even at the middle. The creation is in no way other than me. That one, Brahman, alone is real, because of which the fourth principle, consisting of absolute consciousness, O oh dear Uddhava, this mind subject to its three ordinary states of waking, dream, and deep slumber, the three gunas or modes of prakriti which bring about the three states, as well as the threefold universe, consisting of the cause, the adhyatma, or the senses, the effect, the adibhuta, or, um, or the five elements, and the agent, the adhideva, the gods presiding over the Indriyas, appear through invariable concomitance, and which substance equally persists even when this threefold distinction disappears during the state of samadhi, inwardly, or the state of absorption of the in entire outward universe during the period of pralaya. That which neither existed before nor will persist after the manifest creation does not really exist even in the middle, except in name alone. An effect is the same as that other substance through which it came into being and by which it stands revealed. Such is my conviction. This world of modifications, though it did not exist before, has evolved from Brahman through Rajas and is revealed also by Brahman, which on the other hand is the cause of all by itself and not the effect of any other cause and is the revealer too. It is Brahman alone which appears as this diversified universe consisting of the senses and their objects, the subtle elements, the mind, including the gods presiding over the senses and the mind, and the five gross elements. Resolving one's doubts concerning the self by the aforesaid means of clearly distinguishing Brahman and by rejecting the possibility of the body, etc., being recognized as the self, and by the grace of a wise guru and sated with the bliss of self-realization, one should dissociate oneself from all the senses, Indeed, the body, a product of the earth, the senses, the deities presiding over them, life breath, the air, water, fire, and the mind, which is sustained by food, reason, and the intellect, the ego, ether, earth, the objects of the senses, and prakriti, are not the self. They are all material. What gain can there be to him who has fully realized my truth through his senses, made up of the three gunas, being composed, or say, what harm can befall him through his senses being tossed about? What gain or loss can accrue to the sun through the clouds having gathered or dispersed? As the sky is not affected by the properties of the air, fire, water, and earth, or by the peculiarities that come and go in the various seasons, so the transcendent indestructible is never contaminated by the impurities, the tendencies and actions of sattva, rajas, and tamas, which bring about the transmigration of one who looks upon the body as his self. All the same, Attachment to the pleasures of sense, which are the creations of maya, should be completely eschewed until the impurity attaching to the mind in the form of passion is shaken off through the intense practice of devotion. 
as a disease in men sprouts again and again if treated improperly and causes much pain, so does the mind whose passions and latent karmas to which they are traceable have not been burnt and which has conceived an attachment for all, brings about the fall of one who has not attained perfection in yoga. Those imperfect yogis who are frustrated by impediments in the form of human beings, placed by the gods, take once more to the practice of yoga by force of the habit acquired in previous births, but never to the elaborate course of action. Impelled by some agency, the inner controller or force of destiny, the ignorant man performs actions till his death and is subjected to joy and sorrow and undergoes transmigration thereby. The enlightened soul, however, is not so subjected. Though seated in his body, a product of matter, his thirst for the pleasures of sense having ceased due to his enjoying the bliss of self-realization, and hence does not undergo transmigration, though performing actions all his life. He whose mind is fixed on the self is not aware of the body, whether it is standing or sitting, walking or lying down, answering the calls of nature or masticating food or pursuing any other natural activity. If at all a man of wisdom perceives the various objects of his extroverted senses, he does not recognize as real anything other than the self, for such a thing would be contrary to reason, any more than a man rising from sleep recognizes as real an object seen in a dream and having vanished. This psychophysical organism, a product of ignorance, wonderfully wrought by the three gunas and karmas, which was formerly in the state of bondage, perceived as non-distinct from the self, O dear Udhava, now disappears in the light of self-knowledge. The self, however, can neither be apprehended nor rejected, just as the emergence of the sun disperses the darkness screening the human eyes, but does not create anew what has already been there, so my consummate and true realization dispels the darkness enveloping the mind of man. The self is never hidden from our view, but always directly perceptible. It is self-luminous, beyond birth and death, beyond all proof, unlimited in point of time and space, beyond all change, comprising all sorts of experiences and remaining one without a second when all words cease to describe it. Speech and the senses function only when impelled by it. The notion of difference in the absolute self is entirely a delusion of the mind, for other than one's own self, there is no ground for this, distance, for this difference. The view of some self-conceited men that duality in the form of the body, etc., perceptible with the senses in the form of names and forms and consisting of the five elements cannot be refuted, is a meaningless tall talk. If the body of a yogi who has not yet achieved perfection in yoga and who is still striving is visited by calamities appearing all of a sudden, the following is prescribed as a remedy. One should get rid of some obstacles, such as um, some obstacles, such as heat and cold, through yogic concentration on the moon and the sun, respectively. Uh, should get rid of others, such as flatulence and other ailments, by means of yogic postures accompanied by concentration on the air, and still others, those brought about by evil stars or snakes etc., through ascesis, spells and drugs as required. Some obstacles, such as lust and anger yielding evil results, one should gradually get over through continued contemplation on me by loudly chanting the divine names and so on, and still others, such as hypocrisy and pride, by waiting upon masters of yoga. Some men, having controlled their senses and made their living body exceptionally strong, proof against disease and old age, and ever young by various means, take to the practice of yoga for the attainment of mystic powers, such as transferring one's soul to a dead body and tenanting it. That is, however, not to be made much of by the wise, for the pains taken over such a consummation are futile inasmuch as the body, after all, is perishable like the fruit of a tree and might drop any moment. If the body of a man ever diligently practicing yoga attains exceptional fitness, a wise man should not lay much store by such fitness discontinuing the practice of yoga, he should remain devoted to me. The yogi who, depending on me, diligently carries on the aforesaid practice of yoga is not baffled by obstacles. On the other hand, he is rid of all hankerings and enjoys the bliss of self-realization. Thus ends the 28th discourse in Book 11 of the Great and Glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sankhita. Discourse 29, Courses of Conduct Pleasing to the Lord, 
and Uddhava's departure for Badre Kashrama at the conclusion of the Uddhava Gita. Uddhava submitted, I consider this yogic discipline extremely hard to practice for one who has not been able to control his mind. Tell me explicitly, O immortal Lord, the means by which a man may easily attain perfection. Yogis trying to curb their mind, O lotus-eyed Lord, get tired in their attempt to control it and often feel frustrated because of their not being able to compose it. It is for this very reason that men who are capable of distinguishing the substantial from the, in, from the unsubstantial easily and definitely resort to your lotus feet, yielding the nectar of supreme bliss, O lotus-eyed Lord of the universe. Handicapped, however, as they are by your maya, who being proud of their self-knowledge and their knowledge of ritual acts, do not so resort to you. That you should be subject to the will of your devotees that are exclusively devoted to you, O befriender of all, is no wonder for you, O immortal Lord, who found delight in the company of animals, even though your very footstool is rubbed by the end of the brilliant diadems of Brahma and others. What man who is conscious of good offices done by you to your devotees in the past can possibly turn his back on you as aforesaid, the ruler and the beloved, the very self of the entire creation, who bestow all desired boons upon those that have sought shelter with you? What man will, as a matter of fact, go in for something other than you, which is conducive to good fortune alone and later on to forgetfulness? What good fortune will not attend on us who take delight in the dust of your feet? Even enlightened souls cannot get square with you, O Lord, even through the span of life allotted to Brahma, and feel overjoyed while recalling your obligations. For appearing in the form of the guru outside and in the form of the inner controller within their heart, it is you who drive away the sin and impurities of embodied souls and reveal your true nature to them. Trishuka, begin again. Questioned thus by Uddhava, whose mind was, ex was excessively devoted to him, Sri Krishna, the suzerain lord even of Brahma and others, the rulers of the universe, who having assumed three forms under the names of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva through his own potencies, toys with the world, lovingly spoke, with a soul-ravishing smile on his lips. The glorious Lord said, Hello, I shall tell you the most auspicious courses of conduct pleasing to me, following which with reverence a mortal conquers death, which is so difficult to conquer. With mind and intellect dedicated to me, and his mind and soul finding delight in the courses of conduct pleasing to me, the man should gradually learn to perform all actions for my sake, remembering me all the while. He should take up his abode in holy lands inhabited by pious men devoted to me and follow the conduct of my devotees among the gods, demons, and human beings. He should arrange, either individually or collectively, in my honor on sacred days, processions and great festivities, along with songs, dances, etc., spending large sums of money on a monarchical scale, assuming, of course, that he has such resources. Pure of mind, he should behold me alone, the supreme self, as pervading within as well as without, and unconditioned as the sky, in all created beings, as also in his own self. He who, embracing thus the point of view of self-knowledge alone, regards all created beings as identical with me, O highly enlightened one, and honors them as such, who looks with an equal eye upon a Brahmana or a low-born individual, a thief and a devotee of Brahmanas, the sun and a spark, a tender-hearted and a cruel man, is accounted wise. The spirit of rivalry, fault-finding, and contempt, coupled with self-conceit, surely disappear before long from the mind of a man incessantly engaged in looking upon men and women as no other than myself. Ignoring his own people, even if they laugh at him, and giving up the body consciousness as a result of which one comes to regard oneself as superior or others as inferior, and casting to the winds all sense of shame, he should bow low to all, down to a dog, a pariah, a cow, and a donkey, falling flat on the ground like a log of wood. Until the conviction about all created beings being identical with myself gets rooted in him, he should worship me in the aforesaid manner through the active agency of his speech, mind, and body. Everything is reduced to the absolute Brahman in his eyes. And seeing Brahman everywhere by virtue of knowledge raised to the level of realization, gained by looking upon everything as Brahman and freed from all doubts, he should cease from all activity. Looking upon all created beings as myself through the active agency of mind, speech, and body, 
This indeed is considered by me to be the best of all disciplines. There is no loss in the least degree of this course of conduct in the form of my worship, O dear Uddhava, once it has been taken up in right earnest, because it is free from all craving, and since it has been deliberately determined by me, unaffected as it is by the gunas. Whatever worldly exertion, though fruitless, yet dedicated in a disinterested spirit to me, the Supreme, is exalted to the level of dharma, O most pious Uddhava. Here lies the wisdom of the wise, the cleverness of the clever consists in this, that one attains in this life to me, the immortal and real substance through this bogus and mortal frame. The aforesaid teaching covers the entire range of Vedantic teaching, which has been taught by me to you in a nutshell or in extenso, and which is difficult to grasp even for the devas. Repeatedly has this knowledge of truth been expounded by me in a very lucid and reasoned way. Having grasped it fully, a man will have his doubts dispelled and bids fair to get liberated. He who treasures this question of yours, as well as this discourse containing my reply, will realize the everlasting transcendent Brahman that lies hidden in the Vedas. I shall voluntarily confer my own self on that teacher of Brahman who imparts this knowledge to my devotees most extensively. He who repeats aloud in an, in an intelligent way this most sacred teaching, which is capable of sanctifying others, will get purified in that he will be revealing me day to day to others by the lamp of wisdom. A man who attentively listens to this with reverence from day to day will be practicing supreme devotion to me and will not be bound by actions. I hope, O Uddhava, my friend, the true nature of Brahman has been fully understood by you. I presume also that your mind born infatuation and grief too has totally disappeared. Let this teaching not be imparted by you to a hypocrite, an unbeliever, a cheat, an irreverent listener, one who is not a devotee, and to an insolent person. One should speak about it to him who is utterly devoid of the aforementioned faults, to a devotee of the Brahmanas, to one's own favorite, to a pious and holy man, to the shudras and women folk, if there is devotion in them. Nothing remains to be known by a seeker of knowledge after knowing this just as nothing remains to be quaffed after taking a draught of the immortalizing nectar. To devotees like you, O oh dear Udhava, I myself cover the entire range of the fourfold object of human pursuit, which is partially attained by men through self-knowledge, through duty, um, mystic powers included under the category of kama or enjoyment through the practice of yoga, wealth through the pursuit of agriculture and dominion, for the wielding of a scepter. When having relinquished all duties, a mortal dedicates himself to me. He is chosen by me as an object of special favor and attaining immortality. He then gets qualified in reality for acquiring divine powers or for becoming one with me. Sri Sukha went on. Hearing the discourse of Sri Krishna of excellent renown, Uddhava, who had thus been shown the path of yoga, union with the Lord, stood with joined palms, his eyes overflowing with tears, and could not at that time utter a word in return as his throat was choked with emotion. Controlling his mind, agitated through affection by firmness, O Raja, and accounting himself blessed, he now replied to Sri Krishna, the greatest hero among the Yadus, with joined palms, touching his lotus feet with his head. Uddhava submitted, the thick darkness of ignorance that had been hugged by me has been dispersed by your teaching. Can cold and darkness or the fear born of these possibly prevail against a man who has sought the presence of fire, O creator of Brahma? The lamp of wisdom has been restored to me, your servant, by you, compassionate as you are. Leaving the soles of your feet, what grateful man would seek any other asylum? Nay, the most tough snare of my affection for the, for the Dasharhas, the Vrishnis, the Antakas, and the Satvatas, that had been spread by you through your deluding potency for the propagation of species has actually been torn asunder by you with the sword of self-realization. Salutation be to you, O supreme master of yoga. Instruct me who have come to you for protection so that unceasing love for your lotus feet may abide in my heart. The glorious Lord replied, Enjoined by me, O Udhava, proceed to my hermitage called by the name of Badrikashrama, Hallowed there by bathing in and drinking the water of the Ganga, purged of all impurities, 
by the site of the Alakananda. The, so the, um, the bathing in the Ganga um, would be a step on the way to Bhadrikashrama. The Alakananda is the river which is at Bhadrikashrama. Wearing the bark of trees, O oh dear one, living on wild fruits and free from hankering for pleasure, enduring all experiences in the form of pairs of opposites, such as cold and heat, amiable of disposition, with your senses fully controlled, calm and possessed of a collective mind, endowed with wisdom and self-realization, ruminating most thoughtfully upon whatever you have learned from me and devoting your speech and your mind to me, remain assiduously engaged in duties pleasing to me. Transcending the three courses of destiny, you will then attain to me. Sri Shuka resumed. Instructed thus by Sri Krishna, devotion to whom puts an end to metempsychosis, Uddhava went round the Lord, keeping him always to his right, and placing his head on his feet while departing, bathed those feet with drops of tears, his mind too being moistened with emotion, even though he had transcended the pairs of opposites in the form of mundane joy and sorrow as a result of the Lord's teaching. Alarmed at his impending separation from Sri Krishna, whose affection was most difficult to turn one's back upon and unable to leave him, Uddhava felt ill at ease and suffered agony. Then, bearing on his head the pair of wooden sandals belonging to his master and gifted by himself as a token of his pleasure and bowing to him again and again, he departed. Having firmly installed the Lord in the inmost of his heart, the great votary of the Lord then reached Vishala, another name of Badrikashrama, and practicing austerities according to the rules Krishna had given to him, attained to the state of Sri Hari, as taught by Sri Krishna, the sole befriender of the universe. He who tastes ever so little, with real reverence, this nectar of wisdom churned out of the ocean of bliss, and taught to Uddhava, a great devotee of the Lord, by no less than Sri Krishna himself, whose lotus feet are resorted to even by masters of yoga, like Lord Shiva, is not only liberated himself, but the world at large gets liberated through his fellowship. I bow to the Supreme Person known by the name of Sri Krishna, the first cause, the author of the Vedas, who in order to put an end to rebirth and the fear of old age and disease, extracted like a bee, the nectar, the quintessence of the Vedas in the form of jnana and vijnana, which are the only valuable things, and the immortalizing beverage of the devas churned out of the ocean, and gave this twofold nectar to the two classes of his devotees to drink. Thus ends the 29th discourse in Book 11 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. And thus ends the Uddhava Gita. Discourse 30, the Holocaust of Yadu's race. The Raja Parikshit submitted. Uddhava, a great devotee of the Lord, having proceeded to the woodland of Badrikashrama. What did the Lord, the father of all created beings, do next in Dwaraka? His own race having been wiped out through the curse of Brahmanas, how did Sri Krishna, the foremost of the Yadus, cast off his body? the most beloved of the eyes of all, from which ladies could not withdraw their eyes once riveted on it, which having once entered the ears of the virtuous and then clung to their mind, never departs from it, whose splendor when glorified by poets gives a delightful character to their speech and what goes without saying brings honor to them in looking on which seated in the car of Arjuna, warriors who fell in battle attain similarity to it because they died seeing that form. The sage Sri Shuka replied, seeing evil portents of a grave nature manifest in the heavens and on earth as well as in the air, Sri Krishna spoke thus to the Yadus, sitting together in the assembly hall Sudharma. These grave portents of a terrible nature appearing in Dvaraka are indications of a holocaust. We should not therefore stay here even for an hour more, O leaders of the Yadus. Let the women folk, infants, and aged men move from this place to the sacred spot called Shankodhara, while we, the rest of us, shall proceed to Prabhasa, where the river Sarasvati flows towards the west and joins the sea. Having bathed in that river and thus purified, and remaining without food, we shall all worship the images of gods with a fully concentrated mind by bathing them, daubing them with sandal paste, 
and offering other articles of worship. Having been blessed by the Brahmanas through the recitation of benedictory mantras and offering of flowers, etc., they shall also honor the highly blessed Brahmanas by gifting them cows, lands, gold, and raiments, as well as elephants, horses, chariots, and dwellings. That is the surest way of dispersing evil and the best means of securing happiness. Worship of God, the Brahmanas, and cows bring supreme exaltation to men. Attentively hearing this speech of Madhusudana and saying Amen, the elderly among the Yadus all proceeded to Prabhasa in chariots after crossing the sea by means of barks. There, the scions of Yadu performed with supreme devotion whatever was enjoined by the Lord along with all other means of ensuring prosperity. Then, their judgment having been vitiated by evil destiny, they drank there a highly intoxicating and delicious drink known by the name of Mairayaka, by the filtrates of which the intellect is perverted. There ensued a very bitter clash between the heroes, who were all proud at heart and were hard drunk with the strong beverage and were further deluded by the enchanting potency of Sri Krishna. Inflamed with anger and equipped with arms, they fought with one another on the seashore by means of bows, swords, spears, maces, bludgeons, and lances, closing with one another in chariots and on elephants, as well as on the backs of donkeys, camels, bulls, buffaloes, and mules, and men, bearing on, uh, bearing on signs that fluttered in the breeze, the highly intoxicated warriors hit one another with arrows, even as elephants in the forest would strike one another with their tusks. Pradyumna closed on the battlefield with his brother, Samba, Akrura with Bhoja, Aniruddha with Satyaki, Subhadra with Sangramajit, Gada with Sri Krishna's, uh, Gada Sri Krishna's son, with Gada Sri Krishna's brother, and Sumitra with, Ashur, uh, with um, Ashurata. All the pairs looked very fierce, their rancor having grown very intense. Blinded by intoxication and utterly infatuated by the enchanting potency of Sri Krishna, others too, Nishatta, Ulmuka, and so on, the chief of whom were Sahasrajit, Shatajit, and Bhanu, met and struck one another at close quarters. Casting all affection to the winds, the Dasharhas, Vrishnis, Andakas, Bhojas, and Satvatas, the Madhus and the Arbudas, the Maturas and the Shurasenas, the Visarjanas, the Kukuras, and the Kuntis, these all contended with one another. Sons fought with their fathers and brothers with brothers, uh, maternal uncle, uncles, maternal grandfathers, nephews and sisters' sons, severally crossed their swords with their sisters' sons, daughters' sons, uncles, and maternal uncles. Friends contended with friends and relations with relations, while kinsmen killed kinsmen, deluded as they all were. When the arrows began to be exhausted, bows began to be broken, and weapons began to be depleted, they tore up with their clenched hands blades of eraka grass. Um, this is the grass that when the Brahmanas curse for the destruction of the Yadus was made and generated a um, pestle of cursed iron that was ground up and thrown into the sea. The current washed it, washed it ashore here at Prabhasa, and it grew into these iron rushes of this cursed Eraka grass, whose very purpose was the death of all the Adavas. And so they were compelled by madness and drunkenness to draw up the blades of this grass. Held by the clenched hand, these blades of cursed grass turned into clubs studded with iron, almost as hard as adamant. They began to strike their enemies with them, and being checked by Sri Krishna, they took him as well as Balabhadra to be their adversary, deluded as they were. Resolves to kill even them, the desperados came up before them, O king. Highly irritated, Krishna and Balarama too took up handfuls of Eraka grass, converted into clubs, O delight of the Kurus, and struck them, moving from one place to another in the fray. The fury engendered by rivalry of those warriors who were possessed, as it were, by the curse of the Brahmanas and whose judgment had been obscured by the deluding potency of Sri Krishna, brought about their own destruction, even as fire of bamboos rubbing each other in friction would consume a whole forest. All his own people and their clans having thus perished, Sri Krishna concluded that the remaining burden of the earth was at last removed. Resorting at the seashore to yoga in the form of concentration of mind on the Supreme Person, identifying himself with the Supreme Spirit, Balarama cast off the human semblance. Perceiving the ascent of Balarama to his own realm, Lord Sri Krishna, son of Devaki, 
went up to a people tree, the sacred fig tree, the Ashvata, and sat down quietly on the ground, resting his back against its trunk. He revealed his resplendent four-armed form, and like a smokeless fire dispelled by his own effulgence the gloom of all the quarters. His form now bore the mark of Srivatsa on his breast, was dark of hue like a rainy cloud, was wrapped in a pair of silk pieces and shone like burnished gold and was most auspicious to look at. He had a lotus-like countenance with a lovely smile playing on it, was graced with dark hair, had a pair of delightful lotus-like eyes and was adorned with a shining pair of crocodile-shaped earrings. He was decked with a girdle, the sacred thread, a diadem, a pair of bracelets and armlets, as well as with a pearl necklace, a pair of anklets and rings, and the Kalstupa gem. His limbs were encircled by a garland of sylvan flowers. He was waited upon by his own weapons, discus, mace, and the sharanga bow, in a living form, and was seated placing his left foot, ready on as a lotus, on his right thigh. Jara, a hunter, who had forged his arrowhead out of the iron piece that had been left over after the pulverizing of the pestle generated by the curse of the Brahmanas, pierced Krishna's foot that resembled in shape the mouth of a deer, suspecting him to be an antelope, seeing him obviously through the brush from a distance and taking a long shot. Discovering his quarry to be a four-armed personage, the hunter, who is frightened on, his, on account of his having committed an offense against the Lord, fell prostrate at the feet of Sri Krishna, touching, the, touching his feet with his head. He said, be pleased, O Madhusudhana, to forgive this transgression of mine, sinful as I am, O sinless one, and that it has been perpetuated by this sinner unwittingly, O Lord of excellent renown. Offense has been done to me by you, O Lord Vishnu, whose remembrance, they say, is capable of dispersing the darkness of men's ignorance. Therefore, speedily kill me, a sinful hunter of deer, O Lord of Vaikuntha, lest I should commit offense against noble souls any more than I have done. How can we of impious birth make any observation directly about this gesture? of yours as Sri Krishna, the work of whose hand made Maya, even Brahma, the creator, his sons, Rudra and others, and the seers of Veda, whose vision has been obscured by your Maya, are unable to know. The glorious Lord said, don't you be afraid, Hojara, get up. Indeed, this part of me, of making me the target of your arrow, has been played by you as desired by me. Ascend you as permitted by me to heaven, the abode of the virtuous. Commanded thus by Lord Sri Krishna, who takes form at will, the hunter thrice walked round him clockwise so as to keep him ever to his right, and bowing to him, ascended to heaven in an aerial car brought by Krishna's attendants to take him. Hunting up and tracking out the whereabouts of Sri Krishna by inhaling the breeze charged with the fragrance of Tulsi, Daruka, the Lord's own personal charioteer, sought his presence. Seeing his master seated there at the base of an Ashvata tree and surrounded by weapons appearing in a living form and possessing a dazzling brilliance, the charioteer jumped down from the chariot and fell prostrate at his feet with eyes full of tears, his mind overwhelmed with affection. And Daruka said, O oh Lord, my vision has completely gone and stands enveloped in darkness ever since I have ceased to behold your lotus feet. Even now I fail to recognize the quarters and find no peace of mind any more than a traveler on... Um, even any more than a traveler on the moon having set at night. While the charioteer was speaking thus, the Lord's chariot, which was distinguished by the emblem of Garuda on its banner, rose to the sky, horses, banner and all, O King of Kings, while Daruka stood looking up. The transcendent weapons of Lord Vishnu too followed the chariot. Sri Krishna said to the charioteer, who felt much astonished at heart at, this afores at the aforesaid occurrence, Proceed, O charioteer, to Dvaraka, and communicate to my kinsfolk there the destruction of their relations at the hands of one another. The departure for his own divine realm of Lord Sankarshana, as well as my own predicament. Tell them on my behalf, you should no longer stay at Dvaraka with your relations, for the sea will submerge the capital of the Yadus, forsaken by me. Taking with you each your own family and possessions, as well as our parents, Devaki and Vasudeva, and guarded by Arjuna, you should all leave for Indraprastha without exception. As for yourself, Daruka, follow the course of conduct which is dear to me. Get established in the knowledge of your being one with Brahman. Cultivate an attitude of nonchalance towards the world. 
and realizing this universe to be a creation of my Maya, acquire calmness. Instructed thus by the Lord, Dharaka went round the Lord clockwise to, so as to keep him always to his right, bowed to him again and again, and placing his feet on his head, then proceeded to Dvaraka, sad at heart. Thus ends the 30th discourse in Book 11 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Discourse 31, the Lord's ascent to his divine realm. Sri Shuka began again. Now, after the departure of Daruka, there appeared on the scene Brahma, the creator, as well as Lord Shiva, the source of the universe, along with his divine spouse, goddess Parvati, other gods led by the great Indra, the ruler of the devas, sages accompanied by the lords of creation, the Prajapatis, Pitris, Siddhas and Gandharvas, Vidyadharas and great Nagas, Charanas, Yakshas and Rakshasas, Kinnaras and Apsaras and Brahmanas, like Maitreya, and birds, the Suparnas, belonging to the realm of Garuda, full of great longing and keen to witness the Lord's ascent to his realm, and celebrating and narrating the exploits as well as the story of the advent of Lord Sri Krishna, Sayan of Shurasena. Full of highest devotion, they rain showers of flowers, crowding the heavens with their rows of aerial cars, O Parikshit. Casting his glance on Brahma, the grandfather of the entire creation, the sages Marichi and others being its fathers, as well as on the other gods, his own glorious manifestations, and fixing his mind on his own divine essence, the all-pervading Lord closed his lotus eyes. Not consuming through concentration of mind on the element of fire, his own divine body, which sustains the entire universe and is the all-blissful object of meditation and concentration, he bodily ascended to his own divine realm. So in other words, he passed his body through fire, but the fire did not burn his body. Fire sprang up around him and through the mediumship of Agni, the vehicle, his body left the world. Kettle drums sounded in heaven and flowers rained from the sky. Truth, piety, fortitude, glory, and prosperity departed from the earth along with him. Gods and others, Brahma being the foremost of them, did not behold Sri Krishna, whose ways are unknown to all, entering his own divine realm. While some of them, who were more fortunate than the rest, did perceive him and felt much astonished. So only some of them were able to perceive of these like full-fledged gods, only some of them were able to perceive the subtle course that Krishna followed. The movements of Sri Krishna cannot be perceived by the gods any more than those of lightning disappearing into the sky, leaving a mass of clouds. Amazed to witness the aforesaid disappearance of Sri Hari by dint of his wonderful yogic power and extolling it, the said gods, Brahma, Shiva, and others, for their part, presently withdrew, each to their own realm. Know the advent, leelas, and disappearance of the Supreme Lord among embodied beings, O Raja, to be a mere acting by dint of his maya, as that of a dramatic performer, having created this universe by himself, unaided by others and with no material other than his own volition, and then entered it, sported in it, and withdrawn it into himself at the end, and retired. He remains established in his own glory. Could he have been incapable of protecting himself, preserving intact his own divine personality, he who brought back in his mortal frame the son of his own guru, Sandipani, uh, Sandipani that had been taken to the realm of death? And revived you, O Parikshit, that had been burnt to death within your mother's womb by the supreme missile presided over by Brahma, and discharged by Ashvatama, the son of Dronacharya, and thereby gave relief to your mother, who had sought refuge with him, who conquered even Lord Shiva, the destroyer of death himself, and bodily transferred to heaven the hunter Jara, that had struck the Lord with the shaft and the sole of his foot. Though being the independent cause of the evolution, continuance, and destruction of the whole universe, Wielding as he does all powers, the Lord did not, however, choose to retain his body here on earth, demonstrating thereby to the world the sublimity of the ways of those established in the self and showing their unconcernedness about the mortal body. He who, rising from his bed in the morning, sings with devotion and full of self-control the story of the aforesaid transcendent voyage of Sri Krishna to his own divine realm will attain to the same highest destiny.
returning to Dvaraka and falling at the feet of Vasudeva and Ugrasena, the king of Dvaraka, Daruka, the charioteer of Lord Sri Krishna, bereft of his master, bathed their feet with his tears. He narrated the story of the wholesale destruction of the Vrishnis, O Parikshit. Grieved at heart to hear of it, the people of Dvaraka fainted with grief. Upset at the news of their separation from Sri Krishna, they hastened, beating their heads to the spot where their kinsmen lay dead. Stricken with grief not to perceive their sons, Sri Krishna and Balarama, Devaki and Rohini, as well as their father Vasudeva, lost their consciousness. Afflicted at their separation from the Lord, they gave up the ghost on that very spot. The women folk ascended the funeral pile and hugging each their own husband entered the fire. The wives of Balarama entered the fire, embracing the body of Balarama. The wives of Vasudeva followed suit, hugging the latter's body. And the daughters-in-law of Sri Krishna did the same, clasping to their bosom Pradyumna and the other sons of the Lord. Similarly, Rukmini and others, the spouses of Sri Krishna entered the fire with their mind fixed on the latter. Distressed at his separation from Sri Krishna, his beloved friend Arjuna comforted himself with the utterances that Sri Krishna made to him in the Bhagavad Gita, full of veracious, sta uh, uh, full of veracious statements. Arjuna duly caused to be performed in order of seniority by competent priests, funeral rites for the welfare in the other world of those of his kinsmen that had been slain on the battlefield and whose progeny too had perished in the war. The ocean drowned in an instant the city of Dwaraka forsaken by Sri Krishna. Barring, O great king, the palace of the Lord, which wipes out all evils and is the most auspicious of all auspicious things. And that Lord Sri Krishna, the slayer of the demon Madhu is ever present there. Taking with him to Indraprastha, the um, former capital of the Pandavas and now one of their two major cities, the women, infants and aged men that had survived the slain and having, um, and having settled them, Arjuna crowned as king Vajra, the surviving son of Aniruddha there. Hearing from the mouth of Arjuna of the destruction of their kinsfolk, the others, O Raja, your grandfathers, the Pandavas, all proceeded together to the Himalaya mountains on their voyage to the other world, appointing you, of course, as their successor on the throne of Hastinapura. The man who celebrates with reverence the aforesaid advent and exploits of Lord Vishnu, the adored of the gods, is completely absolved from all sins. A man recounting as aforesaid the most auspicious, infantile and other leelas full of delightful divine feats of the almighty Lord Sri Krishna, the dispeller of the agony of his devotees, heard of here in Srimad Bhagavata as well as in the other scriptures, bids fair to attain supreme devotion to Sri Krishna, the goal of ascetics of the highest order. Thus ends the 31st discourse in Book 11 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita, composed by Bhagavan Veda Vyasa and consisting of 18,000 shlokas. End of Book 11. And I feel like that might be a good pause for today. It's a little earlier than we normally stop, but only by about 10, 12 minutes. And being that that's the end of the entire skanta, I feel like that might be a good break point for the week. Awesome. Thanks, Deva. Yeah, thank you guys very much for coming. Um, yeah, I, I'm fine answering some questions, Mary. And actually, uh, one thing to point out real quick, um, Andy, some weeks ago, I remember you had asked about, um, are there descendants of these people still? Yeah. So Right, because they got, quote unquote, annihilated or whatever, their but, race. So there we have it in detail. A bunch, uh, there yeah. were a bunch of survivors. They, um, Krishna sent the, um, a bunch of the women, a bunch of the children, and so on. Um, they weren't at the massacre at Prabhasa. Um, so the, the surviving branches of the Yadu clan, um, mostly through not the paternal lineages, which all died at Prabhasa, but through some of the maternal lineages, through other um, marriages into related clans and tribes, that, that is how those passed on. Oh, <clears throat> yeah. amazing. 
Um, and yeah, Mary, you're saying you had a question. Uh, these are just two technical questions. Sure. Um, there was mentioned that the Lord gave nectar to two classes of his devotees. What does to that mean, two classes? Um, in, the, in, so in that context, what was being referred to is um, to the first class of devotees um, being ones who desire um, extreme exalted um, pleasures of sense. Um, the main example that was given was Indra and the Devas, and that the class of nectar given to them through their devotion to the Lord at the Samudra Mantanam, with the Lord's direct assistance in the form of the Kurma and Mohini avatars, was the nectar of Amritam, granting them a lifespan of 36,000 years or more, and the uh, perfect body free of disease and pain, full of superhuman pleasure and um, lordship of heaven. The second class of devotee was um, those who um, have realized the bliss of the pure self, infinitely superior to and transcending of the pleasures of senses outwardly, and who desire either moksha in some form or even transcending the desire for moksha, desire only the bliss of ongoing devotional service of the Lord directly. And the nectar, in this case, is a metaphorical nectar, the nectar of pure um, atmanandam, the, 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 the undilute and direct bliss of the self. Great. That, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. The second one, and it's hard to ask a question because I'm enjoying letting that first one settle in. Yeah, sure. Um, um, transcending the three courses of destiny. Yeah, so in that case, what it was referring to is um, essentially um, evolution, devolution, or lateral motion, I guess you could say. Um, like, like just being stuck. Taking, well, taking a higher, essentially taking a higher birth, taking a lower birth, or taking a roughly equivalent birth. Oh, I see. Um, so transcending the three courses of destiny means transcending the process of rebirth, whether you, like, you know, whether you live a life in which you, you're, you're attached to senses and outward things, but you're kind, you do your dharma, you don't hurt people, you get good karma, you get a better birth next time as someone who is richer or more beautiful or more healthy or in some way predisposed to enjoy more sensory pleasures because you gave them to others or versus somebody who hurts other people is harmful and so on is going to get a worse birth and a less pleasant body in which you're going to suffer more or kind of hold even and you get another birth pretty much like the one you have now. Those are the three courses being referred to. Transcending the means transcending the process of rebirth entirely. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you guys all for coming. Oh, I, I had a question, Devla. Go ahead. The the sea will submerge Dwar Dwaraka. Yes. Did it? it? Did. Yeah. Yeah. Did we did we go into that, or did I miss that part? Did it happen? And it, it was a quick... it happened. It, it was brief. It was brief. It, like on oh. one line, it said, in, "In an instant, yeah. the sea submerged the city, except for Krishna's palace, uh, which oh. remained unsubmerged at least for a very long time." Um, wow. Yeah. And are there remnants of that historically, archaeologically? Yeah. Yes, there are. And as a matter of fact, even, it's still there, right? Where the scripture describes it, you can go see it. The, the city of Dwaraka is still there. They rebuilt a city by that name on the new coastline. Um, there's got lots of ancient temples and stuff there to Krishna. It's still one of his major, after Vrindavana and Mathura, Dwaraka is probably the next, well, there's a few other major Krishna temples, but it's one of the main holy cities to Krishna still. In India, it's on the coast of Gujarat, the modern state of Gujarat, India. Um, and indeed, archaeologists um, looked under the ocean just off the coast. And sure enough, there is a big city on the ocean floor out there that like you can look up videos of it from people who went down there in like little submersibles and sent down cameras with drones and divers. They recovered all sorts of treasures from it. It's really there. Wow. Um, yeah, the, it's a, it's a well-known archaeological site. 
Uh, my understanding is the government closed it off for exploration, so it's restricted now. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously it would be very difficult for just a random person to get down there. It's deep underwater. But yeah, um, yeah the, the, there's, there currently are not ongoing archaeological digs going on there um, because of um, the, the government had been funding it and they cut off the funding for it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's expensive to do archaeology hundreds, oh, absolutely. Of, feet, hundreds of feet under the ocean, you know. also wanted to protect it as well. I mean, I'm hoping they are. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but, Probably mon money was more than motivated. Yeah. But they, they took plenty of camera footage down there, video footage, brought lots of samples up. Cool. It's, it's a well-established thing. You can, you can research it and you can like a bunch of pieces taken from it are in museums in India. And you can look at the video footage yourself if you want that they took of it down there. It's, I mean, it's murky it's it's far enough down that you're not seeing by sunlight so much as by you know like flashlights on the on the equipment and it's full of kind of the water is not very clear it's because it's there's a lot of the coastal current kind of swirls sand and churn along and so it's really murky down there but they dug up like big buildings and pillars and piles of treasure and all sorts of stuff it was clearly healthier meet kachava sorry Oh yeah i just found a link <laughs> i forgot i was oh, yeah. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's 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 cool it's a real archaeological find it, it's hard to um it's hard to date all of the pieces found in there and samples because the the current along the coast rolls stuff along the coast so you have stuff that's a hundred years old you have stuff that's two thousand years old that all just kind of gets rolled together in the churn in the sand along there. And so it's a jumble of ancient and later, you know, pieces of rotting shipwrecks from like the Mughal era. There's all sorts of stuff down there, but um, it, there was clearly a very ancient city there that did get submerged. Wow. Uh, one more question. Um, mm -hmm. So the Yadu's the Yadu's drank the uh, intoxicant, my, my Ray my Yaka. How do you say it? Yeah, Mayreaka. Is that what, was that the, the deciding, I mean, was that what triggered them to go into that? M fight? M M yeah, fight. Essentially, I mean, the, the, the Maya of Krishna, it, it specified that like the drunkenness alone would not have impelled them to all kill each other. Krishna's Maya yeah. was put in the equation because that was what he intended. Um, but the the fact that they were all drunk was part of it yeah wow yeah wild cool thanks guys thanks Dave a lot thank you all very much yeah namaste almost almost done namaste namaste